Thank you very much. And um, let me start by saying that I'm not at all an expert in this field. Uh, maybe that's reassuring to some of you. I don't, I'm not an expert in prostitution. I'm not an expert on the research on, on this topic. So uh, uh, I come to this empirical material from uh, um, political science uh, uh, background uh, and uh, the literature in political science relating to, to norm change. What I would like to do is to uh, look in, uh, in the detail we can look at it uh, in. Uh, at a public debate about the the, the normative the, the normative changes or the the sex buying act in Norway the the public debate what kind of arguments uh, what kind of um, actors in the discussion etc and then I will try to relate these empirical uh, findings to be modest that they are not really very scientific but what we can glean from the empirical debate and relate that to, uh, to normative change, to discuss in a bit, um, do we see a normative change here? What has characterized the debate? And there are two very good papers this afternoon, uh, Pia Paolo Donati's paper, very rich paper on normative change and also Professor Popora's uh, paper on the same topic. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, start by uh, making uh, some references to those papers, uh, uh, although you will discuss them at length. Uh, Professor De Pier Paolo, uh, he writes that we live in a postmodern age of uh, uh, where there are individualized uh, views of almost everything. There is no underlying anthropology or moral system uh, of, uh, of ethics or morality, uh, and he says all social systems, economy, politics, justice, family, etc., are now operating without significant relations with a presupposed morality, understood as a predefined system of values uh, and norms that justify action. So in a way, we can't, we can't expect um, really consistency, we can't expect uh, as a sort of set of principles. And there's a large literature on uh, post-modernity, as you know, uh, but this is um, also um, a kind of fleeting contingent morality that decides case by case, quote, based on the situation for what is good and bad. And I think that is relevant to the evaluation of of what we see in, in this case of moral discussion, so to speak. Uh, it is uh, rather superficial, the normative change, I believe. <clears throat> it is rather pragmatic, and it has been uh, definitely caused by uh, this law uh, that I will analyze for you. Uh, Professor Popora's paper, which we will o you will always discuss uh, in the afternoon, uh, he talks uh, about the relationship between law and ethics, morality. Uh, as you know, Abraham Lincoln said, the law teaches. Therefore, when, when he actually, Lincoln spoke about slavery, he said to Douglas, uh, who said, uh, the politician Douglas in America said, there's a majority still for slavery, so we must keep slavery. And uh, Abe Lincoln famously said, the law teaches. So there, this is in, against the intrinsic uh, good of the human being, so we cannot keep slavery. And uh, the law is also reflecting then morality, ethics, and so on. That's the natural law um, position, of course. Uh, and the curiosity is, in a way, that in Norway, uh, there is no natural law tradition, no source of from this tradition, no reflection on this. There is a positive view of law. Law is a pragmatic instrument for, for um, uh, resolving conflict, for regulation of society. We have a strong, strongly positivistic legal culture, uh, but at the same time, the law seems to be the only source of what is good or bad, uh, as I will get to. And Professor Pompora, he says sometimes, uh, 
um, expectations of norms, what's good and bad, are even enshrined in law. Legalization does not necessarily imply any greater moral weight. Uh, legality and morality only overlap, they do not coincide. And I would uh, say that in the Norwegian or maybe Nordic cases, uh, law and morality overlaps <coughs> very much. What is criminalized is, uh, is bad, uh, what is legal, what is not is allowed and is, um, is okay. So the, the, the key is that there's a key, key overlap in law and morality for lack of, of any other sources of morality. Now these are just uh, starting reflections. Let me now turn to the, to the uh, rather, should one say, thin empirical paper, also because there isn't so much empirical material, but I think um, there, are, there are interesting aspects of this, nonetheless, uh, in, this, uh, in this material. As we have heard from my uh, friend Steina here, the law has had effects, uh, and there was a debate, there is a current debate uh, on whether to retain the law. Uh, the government, the present government, a liberal conservative government, uh, wants to um, uh, abolish it because they want um, uh, sort of a, a free market prostitution. They, they have a, a liberal profession uh, sort of idea of prostitution in mind. They are, they were against the law, these parties, they are still against the law, although the major conservative party is, as we will see, changing its mind or has already changed its stance. So we have one debate, uh, which is the major part of my paper from 2008 and 9, prior to the enactment. And then we have a current debate, which is ongoing. And I want to share with you what, uh, we, can, what we can find empirically about the argumentation and the actors here. Uh, the law was, um, uh, was proposed in uh, 2008 and adopted in 2008 uh, and it penalizes um, the buying of sex by six months to up to one year. It also applies the law extraterritorially, which is, uh, I think, an, um, unprecedented for a small country to do this. Uh, so that's a sort of an extra punishment because they, uh, lawmakers knew that many Norwegian men uh, would go to uh, the Baltic states, go to um, Thailand and so on for the buying of sex. So by imposing it extraterritorially, they would try to prevent this, uh, this traveling. And as uh, Steina said, there was a, a Norwegian, now deputy minister uh, in the transportation ministry, uh, who was caught in Latvia, uh, exposed by Norwegian press that he bought uh, prostitution and uh, it was, I think he was fined and he was extremely apologetic. He, he has survived politically. He is acting in, acting in politics now as a deputy minister. So that tells you something about uh, sort of the, uh, yes, he said mea culpa, but in the long run, one didn't, uh, it didn't have devastating effects for his political career. Uh, because Norway is a country where sex is very much regarded as, uh, as a biological drive. Uh, it has to be satisfied. And then uh, to say that um, uh, why not have a, a transaction involving money, what's wrong with that? If, there's not, if sex is simply some, something you need to procure somehow, then if there is no pressure, oppression, or trafficking, then why should it be uh, of any concern to society? So this, I think, is the underlying narrative, the underlying uh, views, almost. Then uh, the Labour government back in 2008 um, proposed this law. And um, not surprisingly, the Labour government politicians um, were the most active in the debate uh, and uh, we have all the uh, newspaper clippings um, uh, about the debate, so we, uh, we can, in a way, look at it quantitatively and qualitatively in a type of content analysis. Uh, you have heard about the effects of the law, the evaluation today. 
but let's take a step back and look at the, the debate from the beginning. Um, there were similar effects in Sweden and Norway. Uh, effect of normative change in younger men, effect of reduction of demand. So uh, there was recently a New York Times article uh, on the Swedish sort of uh, picture, which is longer back, goes back to 99, um, where it is, um, uh, it is a strengthening of this kind of legislation, of course, it's a strengthening of this policy that uh, you have two countries that report similar effects. And we can assume that there will be policy uh, lending or uh, policy ideas travel between countries. So when we have Norway, Sweden with uh, the same findings and we have um, European Parliament, perhaps the UK, possibly France, um, we have countries, Finland, we have countries that adopt similar le legislation. And the more you have of these countries doing that, there will be more of a case for a sort of general European legislation in the end. And there is, um, this could be a very good development. So the evaluation uh, of the law and the findings uh, play a key role, not only in Norway, but I think internationally, uh, with a view to the prospect of, um, of uh, similar laws elsewhere. Uh, when we look at the law, what it says, uh, it, it doesn't talk about morality, it doesn't talk about norms, but uh, the implications are very clear that uh, this cannot be a liberal profession, so to speak, uh, if the buyer is criminalized. If the buyer is a criminal, then the seller, uh, this has implications for the seller. The seller is no longer um, uh, uh, simply selling a product, the, the, the seller becomes complicit um, and logically you redefine the seller when you define, redefine the buyer. And I, uh, I, I point to the old famous uh, dialectic by Hegel, um, the master servant, when the master can define himself as the master by implication, uh, he is the master of someone, so the servant uh, identity is then Im implicit in the relation. So the servant can redefine himself as a free person only when, when he can redefine the master. So this is a dialectical relationship. And the same logic, of course, applies to the Norwegian prostitutes. Now that their customers are criminals, what are they? Uh, and nobody has told them <laughs> what the answer to that is. Are they complicit in crimes? Uh, are they, uh, in a way, what kind of so moral, moral, social, ethical status uh, will they have? So I can understand very well that they are very upset about this uh, change. Um, and uh, uh, I think that the, 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 key, um, the key framing of this issue in Norway, in the Norwegian debate, is the framing of all prostitution as linked to trafficking, that one has, in a way, conflated uh, the traffic, the increase in trafficking with all prostitution. So uh, this, is a, this is maybe illogical and in, not empirically correct, yet, uh, as we will see, once the issue is uh, linked to the trafficking debate and framed as trafficking, you know, Michel Foucault's uh, Category, well, you, you have to categorize something and you're either there or there. I mean, the one that frames the issue um, decides also how others are framed. So there's a tremendous power in the framing process. This is what he calls production of power, productive power. Uh, and this is exactly what happened, that empirically, objectively, empirically, there was an increase in trafficking trafficked prostitutes, as we saw the details of here, and the same happened in Sweden and all over Europe, mainly Nigerian trafficked women, and then uh, the framing was on trafficking, not on prostitution. Um, and uh, it's interesting how uh, it, there is here an objective dimension, of course, what actually happened, what are the empirical data on the trafficked prostitutes vis-a-vis -vis the, the others. Uh, so that this is the objective dimension, but there's also a subjective 
uh, and very powerful uh, issue of uh, the, uh, accomplishing the framing. So if you accomplish successfully to frame an issue, uh, then uh, you have some reference to the objective facts, but you also have um, ways of the, the words matter, words matter, uh, and co context. So it's a sort of constructivism matters and uh, empirical um, facts matter, and they, and they, in a way, they both are needed for the successful framing, unless you live in North Korea, <laughs> or you can frame an issue without any reference to reality. Uh, so uh, in this debate, um, we find that uh, uh, there are sort of important witnesses uh, to the fact that trafficking is, the, uh, is, the, is what it's all about. In Sweden, the main prosecutor says uh, he was against the law, but now he has worked on the problem, met the girls. Uh, I realized by meeting and talking to these girls that I was wrong. They were victims of oppression. These are very, uh, of course, very impressive, very uh, powerful statements. Uh, in Norway, the chief prosecutor in uh, near Bergen, county of Hordalam, uh, says the same. Uh, and the police <coughs> say that we can, we can really do something about this when we have the prioritization of it, when we, can, when we have the law. So uh, the police have been uh, in favor of this, um, of this law. So there is a real connection between the law and, and trafficking, certainly. Uh, but what has come to pass in the debate is that the trafficking issue has do completely dominates the debate. So prostitution as an issue is not debated. Um, so when we evaluate the debate, it's extremely important to see what was the factual situation, trafficking versus other prostitutes at, at the outset. There was, however, uh, a quite an open field when the debate started around 2008. Um, there was, um, uh, I would say, that the main, the main Norwegian view would have been that prostitution is a transaction of, uh, that must be permitted and cannot be criminalized. Uh, and uh, some of the participants in the debate are in this so-called upper sort of luxury, what we call luxury prostitutes. Uh, some of them are students. Uh, one even um, gave interviews under her full name. She's a law student, or was a law student then, Hege Grostad. And she says, um, this is a good way of making money for my studies. I rather enjoy it to be an escort. I make uh, up to 2,000 euros per night. Norwegian businessmen or businessmen come to Oslo. Uh, and uh, she only feared the tax man because, of course, <laughs> the tax authorities have contacted these women who have been uh, giving their names and c given them quite big uh, uh, tax claims. And uh, that has led to sort of bizarre argument that now they have to work as prostitutes even more to pay the, the taxes. <laughs> Uh, so this is the sort of, if you want to legalize it and have it as a normal business, you have to pay taxes, and they are up to 50% in Norway. Uh, then you have the drug users, who, who we, whom we heard uh, have declined in numbers, and they have entirely different uh, needs. They must make money for the daily drug dose, uh, and they, I think they have been outcompeted a lot by the Nigerians. So there has been this um, sort of segment of the market consisting of uh, Norwegian um, up, upscale prostitutes or luxury prostitutes uh, who are e extremely angry about uh, this law and they are in their own apartments and so on. They're not in the street pros prostitution. Um, we have a, a master's thesis uh, in Norwegian in legal sociology which has analyzed uh, all, all this data in a way, so I haven't myself gone into reading all the articles. <coughs> so his findings, Peter Andersen, uh, are mainly the, um, much of the basis for what I'm now saying, quite straightforward, not surprising findings. Um, big increase in debate around the time of adoption of the law. 
Uh, and the main theme of most articles, the population of articles, that N is, N is 378 over uh, three, four years. Most of the articles talk about uh, the um, uh, criminalization, why it is necessary. Uh, about 30% of these articles favor criminalization, about 26% are neutral, 25% are against. So it's an open, it's an open field. Uh, it's not a pre-determined um, uh, pre, um, conclusion at all when the debate uh, starts. And uh, we have a very good and lively kind of public debate. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, the framing, the successful framing, uh, came later in the debate. At the, outside, at the outset, it was quite an open question whether one would criminalize or not. Um, and uh, the major participants, uh, Labour Party politicians that proposed the law, left socialists that supported the law. Um, they made up the biggest number. Then the uh, two organizations for uh, the prostitutes, Prion and the social outreach, pro, pro, the Pro Center, that also gave much of the data for the study, uh, that work with the prostitutes. Uh, both of these organizations were against criminalization. Uh, journalists and so on, um, and uh, Christian Democrats, a small Norwegian party, they were the ones we could expect to have a more, <clears throat> more of a moral argument about prostitution and not only trafficking, but they didn't uh, play much of a role uh, in this debate. Uh, so uh, churches in Norway, there's no church, the Catholic church is very small, 1% of the population, so we had the large state church, Lutheran church, um, they didn't seem to, there was not much coming by way of more profound discussions about human dignity, human nature, and so on. The ones that were most active in this regard, talking about, talking about prostitution as a problem, as a morally degrading way of living, uh, were the feminist organizations. And they were all for the law. Uh, we had um, one of the sort of bastions of liberal, uh, liberal view on prostitution, uh, the ma major daily, Dag Blauder, changed its view uh, throughout the debate, saying that uh, uh, this is no longer a prostitution issue, it's a trafficking issue. So once the agenda is on trafficking, then of course nobody is for trafficking. It's impossible to, to be critical of trafficking, to, of a trafficking, anti-trafficking law. Although we had an anti-trafficking law prior to this and also an, an, a law forbidding uh, pimp, pimp activity. Those that do not participate in the public debate are the buyers of sex. And um, this, uh, it's not really surprising, but given the sort of liberal attitude uh, to sexuality in, in Norway, why aren't they um, active in the debate? They could have written anonymously. They could have said, this is a market, I'm a buyer. There were some, of course, that have been interviewed as buyers of sex, but in other contexts. So these uh, soon to be criminalized customers did not uh, at all participate, which indicates that uh, there's a certain feeling of shame attached to this to this, although one can say it's a business transaction, it is, there is still a feeling of shame uh, that prevents uh, this kind of uh, participation in a debate. There was yet not any uh, dominant view. The, the outcome was uncertain, although the majority parties in government, the government, Labour, left socialists, they had a small majority, so they, they could say, we will pass the law. But there was a real debate, nonetheless. And uh, there was not this kind of silencing or shaming of, uh, of, the, of one of the sides, which we often see in public debates about moral issues. Abortion was uh, debated very, very fiercely in Norway 30 years ago. But today, there's no debate whatsoever. It's a kind of, uh, you get shamed or you get marginalized. You get, 
there's no possibility of any debate. It's sort of uh, you're against women's freedom if you want to discuss, uh, if you have a, uh, if you're not pro-abortion, then you are anti-women. It's, it's extremely harsh kind of uh, categorization or framing of people. So this is the Noel Neumann's uh, kind of spiral of silence that uh, one, once a position has become dominant, then, uh, <clears throat> then uh, people are marginalized and, and silenced and stigmatized uh, if they have a divergent view. That was not the case in, in this, uh, on this issue. What, however, seems to uh, uh, have played a role was the um, uh, the factual, it was all the knowledge or data or facts. Uh, when we get to the, uh, um, uh, the, the present situation, uh, we see that, uh, I, w I will get to that in a moment, we see that facts mattered a lot. In the, in the debate about uh, before passing the law, the moral arguments mattered in 52% of the articles, but they were not about anthropology, dignity. Uh, they were not about basic uh, moral issues. They were much more about pragmatic issues. It was extremely easy to say, yes, trafficking is bad and we must combat trafficking. The key issue uh, then uh, was, uh, is really that there were no moral arguments, there was no debate about prostitution as such. Uh, it was, uh, the, the agenda was at this point beginning to be set firmly on trafficking as the empirical uh, reference for prostitution. And once that succeeded, then clearly there was no point in opposing that, nobody would oppose that. So only the feminist groups argued against um, uh, argued against prostitution uh, as, uh, um, no, the, the, the Christian Democrats uh, argue that prostitution is a moral problem and so on. Uh, but uh, most of the, those that uh, participated at the, at the end of the debate, they were uh, only co focusing on trafficking. So once the agenda was set on trafficking, it was unassailable. Uh, but um, it was, uh, uh, there were few moral arguments about relating to uh, human nature or to uh, prostitution in a, as a de degrading activity and so on. Uh, that kind of basic moral arguments uh, was hardly seen. So uh, I think without the trafficking uh, problem in Norway, prostitution would simply have continued the legislation would have continued. Now the law was passed, five years have passed uh, since then, it has been evaluated and what happens now? Um, I think we can say that the findings have become, uh, have come to be of key importance uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the political <coughs> debate and uh, the current government is now reversing its uh, decision to, um, to uh, abolish the law. So the liberal side, in a way, the liberal arguments have lost. The governing uh, Conservative Party uh, says, um, we don't really know what to do. We will look at the, the law. The young Conservatives stick to ab abolition of the law. Uh, but I'm quite sure that the government will keep the law. And there's a direct link, causal link, between the empirical findings of his study and this position. So uh, it is a functionalist, pragmatic, uh, sort of very, very commonsensical view that if a law works, it's, it, it, it's, it will be retained. But the government party, Heire, used to say that we shouldn't have this kind of a law because it isn't right. Now it says if the, the law works, then we, we should keep it. So I think the uh, explanation is basically that it is now unpopular. Public opinion favors the law, hence the government will also favor the law. Again, it's a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic thing. And opinion leaders uh, who are uh, leading politicians in Oslo, they favor the law. They are from the Conservative Party. 
The only uh, sort of more substantial argument around this, uh, which con contains an argument about prostitution as such, comes from uh, feminist organizations. Uh, one, the oldest one, Norsk Kvinnesaksforening from 1884, uh, says prostitution is harmful and oppressive to women. They are huge health damage for women. It upholds gender stereotypes of women as objects for men. These attitudes lead to violence towards women. We therefore must outlaw the buying of sex also for the future. And the government must enact programs to help women out of prostitution now. So this is uh, sort of, uh, um, and they say we will fight the government on this. Uh, another liberal voice uh, that has the opposite point of view and sticks to it is the leader of the Young Conservatives saying that the Sex Buying Act leads to more indoor prostitution, which you contested that, to less trust in the police, to social stigma, uh, and so on. So the prostitutes, all prostitutes are stigmatized because of this law. So the, the law destroys working conditions for all prostitutes. Uh, and um, uh, also a major study from Fafo, my Helen Schilbred says that how could you evaluate the law so quickly? Uh, we don't know whether trafficking covers is so pervasive. Uh, she attacks the knowledge base, the database. Uh, she says it's very hard to say anything conclusive about the extent of trafficking in the Norwegian prostitution market. Um, and their mapping does not yield clear results, she says. Uh, those who were, know the sex market in Norway also know that it cannot be mapped in just six months. So she is attacking, in a way, your database and your conclusions. So it's, a, it's an attack on what's the empirical basis here. Uh, and um, uh, this Tonning Riese says, there must be a distinction between sex workers who want to work in the profession and those that are forced to do so. So the policy uh, he advocates, he says, is the mainstream policy internationally and cites a lot of other countries and their policies. So I think um, we can say that uh, what matters in the Norwegian debate is uh, the empirical facts uh, that are somewhat contested perhaps, but in this case, <coughs> his evaluation has played a key role in establishing what the epistemic uh, sort of status is. And in, in the literature and political science, we look at normative change, particularly human rights change. And um, uh, there are, you know, Catherine Sickink is one person, Thomas Risse, Judith Goldstein, these are people that work on international affairs. Three sources of legitimacy for normative change, international, especially UN legislation, uh, uh, rules in a way, um, uh, knowledge, data, science, research, epistemic community, if you can sort of agree, and public opinion coming from below, the people wants. And these, these are the three sources that uh, legitimate and drive normative change. And often a public debate can have a sort of, they talk about the cascade of norm, a normative cascade uh, where you get so much input uh, for normative change that is very hard to be against it. I don't see such a really big ch uh, normative uh, cascade in this case because this wasn't, after all, the biggest issue in, in our public debate at the time, and it isn't now. Uh, but I see that uh, normative change in our country relies extremely much on le legislation, on criminalization. Smoking was half criminalized. You cannot smoke in, inside, in buildings, and a, a lot of, a, a ban on smoking in restaurants and so on. That has led to a stigma of smokers. The smokers are framed in a way as low class, primitive, uh, uneducated, and so on. And very few people smoke, but very many young people snuff. You know this, <laughs> they snuff. That's highly acceptable, but it's of course the same kind of activity. Surrogacy in the process of normative change that will lead to political change, unfortunately, I think, framed as a win-win. Indian women get money, have a life, uh, have an income. Uh, gay couples in Norway get children. 
uh, very much a heavy kind of normative cascade on that. So I think we, um, uh, we see this, this normative change in younger men that they are not going to buy sex is this kind of change. It is a criminal activity uh, when it's traffic. It's a criminal activity. Uh, we are not going to be associated with that. So it's a, it's a question of pragmatism much more, I think, at the beginning is a pragmatic response to, uh, to um, uh, in a way, the law and police and so on, which is understandable. And then uh, the normative change um, becomes more uh, deeper and more permanent. We are a very law-abiding society, very conformist perhaps. Uh, there's a tremendous trust in the state, in the law, in the state, in the police. Uh, we don't have much, we don't like conflict or um, pluralism too much, so I think we can find some important um, sort of preconditions for uh, a great overlap, a great degree of overlap between law, law and uh, norms. Thank you.